I'm gonna summarize for the people because we got fired up, but we got started on some shit. <laughs> we forgot to hit record. The Zamboni is arguing that house elves should be in chains and miserable. Okay, let's and start. I from am the right. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so. Brian has a baby in the crib. Baby is going through Harry Potter for the first time. It is very exciting. I don't know if y'all have ever read Harry Potter for the first time. The shit is hype. So my man's is going through it right now and he's in the middle of book five. He is encountering house elves for the first time. You, yeah. you want to tell us a little bit about that, Brian? Yeah, yeah. So we're, what I want to do with him is let him have the full space to wander around this conversation, right? I want to start thinking with shit. And mm -hmm. one of the first things he gets fired up about, actually a little bit of anticipation of where Hermione goes, right? He hasn't quite gotten there yet. Is that he's like, hey, I don't know if it's totally right that the house elves do all this work, aren't paid, are forced to do things, everything else. I'm like, okay, it's good. It's good. And he's like, it's weird that only the rich families have house elves because if they're free labor, how come the poor families don't have them to to use? How come like the Weasleys use like magic technology shit that always breaks and you know that kind of stuff? Homie makes an excellent point. And I was like, well, maybe it's not the wealth of the family that is the reason they have the house up. Maybe these other families are just cool with slavery, right? And then I told the story to Zamboni and he was like, well, is it slavery? Which is a very good question. So now you can pick up where it is. Sure. Right. Okay. So the, the question here is, is it slavery if it's consensual? Because right. if we notice it, that the house elves prefer this arrangement, this is what they want to do with their time. All they want to do is serve and make sure that the shit is going down properly, that the that the uh, robes is ironed up all good and that they, that we, the tea is ready and all this. That's that's how they want to live their lives. We remember Binky, who gets free. It is Winky. I double checked it. Winky. Insane, very well done. I did double check it. <laughs> Excellent. Very well done. I was ready to wild out here. Just uh, I, I didn't want them coming for you, man. I didn't want the, the Harry right. Potter Nazis coming after you. <laughs> yeah, you know how you know how many of them are uh, watching this podcast. So, so Winky gets free. Hermione, in fact, frees Winky. This is not what Winky wants. Winky no. weeps for weeks on end about her freedom. She can't go and do the thing, fulfill her purpose in life, which is looking out for her family. And so uh, the obvious um, metaphor here is to dogs, right? right? Like we can think about dogs, uh, like a working dog is a happy dog. A, a shepherding dog is not only the happiest dog that ever lived, but is delighted. All this dog wants to do is herd those sheep. And so the idea of taking that away from the dog who would otherwise be doing this work. Like, why would you do this? Now, I do think, and we were, we were getting into this piece a little bit. I do think that, like, I have a weird opinion here. I simultaneously think that people who take away the purpose of dogs, right? You, in, you turn the dog and you, you, I don't mind if people think of, you know, use terms like fur baby or my son or whatever for the dog. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is when people treat dogs like they're toddlers rather than like dogs, right? Because they're not the same. Dogs need to be treated like dogs. So I really, I feel that intensely. At the same time, I do think there is a level of consent that dogs give us that's important to give them in the sense that like if your dog is always trying to run away, that's not your dog, right? Like that dog doesn't like you. That dog doesn't want to be there. Like they have a certain amount of choose their pack ability. And I actually think mm -hmm. that a lot of the like, misbehavior you see in dogs is they don't they don't like the way you're doing things they, they don't they don't want to be a part of the pack you have forced them into and they're they're mad or you're a shitty owner which is also you know but you'll notice i still do use that uh, owner is the word that comes out of my mouth there actually to be fair sure it should sure. be pack leader or whatever but like I'm yeah old. person is the one that i always use or yeah, yeah. i just yeah, you're just like yeah, you're you're their person, you're, you know, your where companion, they're, they're yeah. or ha human, you know, yeah. they're yeah, yeah, rather yeah. than uh, owner yeah. and and slave. But um, the 
All right. So, so yeah. Okay. Sure. At the same time, you know, like I am not mad at a fence. No, I'm not mad at a door. Dogs routinely make terrible decisions. They are the worst decision makers that have uh, the world has ever done. They're terrible at judgment. And that's so the, the I, other you don't get I to want. choose where you go, homie. No, no, no. I get to choose where you yeah. go because I'm me. <laughs> Listen right. to what I said. I am the ultimate authority. I don't care what you think. You're going to be right here. I... <laughs> I do think dogs make terrible decisions is another great t-shirt idea, but the, um, yeah. So my, uh, terrier who passed this year, um, he shout out, shout out to you playboy. Yeah. Oscar's Oscar. He's a good one. He, um, mm -hmm. well, he was the, the, if you've met him, he was a, like, if he had been a Fox, he would have been a really great Fox mm -hmm. as a dog. He was like, you know, mid grade. <laughs> In terms of behavior, like, <laughs> sure, you had to set your expectations to Fox, and then he was great. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was, um, he had been wild, he had been abused in his first home, like, he had encountered a lot of shit. This was a dog that did not like other people, did not want to deal with other people, loved me just fine, you know what I mean? But he didn't, and he hated cars. And he only had one way to deal with things that he hated, which was attacking them. Mm -hmm. And so he needed to be on a leash because he would, you know, he, he, he never had off leash time because it's not that even that he wouldn't come back, he would usually come back. And sometimes we we're at a lake or something. We let him, let him run around. He's okay. But if there was a vehicle that approached you or a possibility of a vehicle, he was going to attack it. Like there was mm -hmm. no, if mm -hmm. Sandra butts. And in fact, when we were first moving from Syracuse, he got really panicked that we were moving. He didn't understand what was happening. Right. Cause we'd put him in the backyard with the fence to like mm -hmm. pack up some stuff, but he sees stuff leaving the house. He understands something's going on. He gets panicked. He jumps the fence, which I didn't know he could do. Yeah. He, he attacks he the car. Lift. He's, he's yeah. 10 pounds or something. He was tiny. He just went, whoop, whoop. But he, uh, he attacked a car. He mm. bit its back tire and <laughs> spun out into the road, like road rashed himself all across the chest. And then to your point about dogs and making good decisions, decided he had shamed the family and went and hid under a neighbor's porch, I guess to die. <laughs> yeah. We uh -huh. had to go over there and get him. I have this great picture of me holding him in the vet's office. And he just looks like I fucked up a ton today. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. Totally. And so, the, the thing about right that about is the remorse that. is not changing his mind either. <laughs> Next time he no. sees cars, he's fucking that shit up another no, he's time. Do it again. Exactly. If we were in that same parking lot, and he wasn't <laughs> right. on a leash. He'd get bandaged up and go right for it again. So, the dog analogy is good. It, it is. It is the right one in a lot of to ways. the house elves, right? To not elves. to slaves. Yes. Yes. This right. is different. Yeah, which, this is a different yes. thing. If you have humans who are slaves, it's very important. See, this is part of this is like that Willie Lynch sort of shit. You know what I mean? Where you like yeah. the you, you how to how to make a slave, right? Like you you got to make a slave out of human beings. You got to take things from them. You got to make sure that they don't think of themselves as humans and all of that, right? In order to uh, make slavery a viable option in that sort of situation, and then you then you can get into this place of like, oh well, this is the, like the natural order of things, and so maybe we should uh, enslave these people for generations and all this right like that is some bullshit and that's i'm not advocating for that i am saying that we can maybe have a complicated relationship to the idea of slavery especially since we can look at hermione in this story and hermione's first thing is to go and be like i gotta free the house elves and the house elves are like bitch get out of here we are working right. what are you doing right. and then she and goes and frees winky and it's terrible for her i think it's an interesting moment in terms of world building, because we're learning about it through two characters who don't actually know what's up, right? Through, because we see most things through the lens of Harry. Harry has no idea what's going on. Harry wouldn't know what's going on if he was raised in the wizarding world. He still wouldn't know what's going on, but like he double doesn't know. And then Hermione is also a muggle, right? She didn't grow up in the wizarding mm -hmm. world either. She doesn't know either. So she's cross applying the wrong lens to the scenario right except she's got a cat except she's got a cat kind of a fucked up cat if i remember right but the um 
cats and cats also see, insist on independence and freedom. Cats are different, right? Cats are yeah, different than yeah, dogs. Yeah, for sure. And Crookshanks yeah. isn't like in the crib most of the time. Crookshanks be around, <laughs> just like no, run and around, in fact, and show up in a spot and be like, "Oh shit, it's Crookshanks." Like, if we take the the slavery option off the table for just a second, just think with cats. Sure. Hermione is a cat owner, right? She's yeah, like, these sure. guys really do need the freedom to leave when they yeah. want. They'll do mm-hmm. what they want to do, you know. Um, sure. Again, applying the wrong lens. The what I think is, although she doesn't a, think that they're cats, she doesn't think households are cats. She thinks households no. just slaves. Yeah, and because so, they speak in English, which is important. Now, so okay, yes, right. So where I want to get to eventually with this is spirits. You know what I mean? Like that's what I want to get. Oh yeah, yeah, cats, sure, yeah, yeah. Right? Ordering people around, right? Right, right. Mm-hmm. And figuring out what's good. Because I, I actually do think there's something to the relationship we have with animals that can be a model for relationships with spirits. Sometimes they're the animal, sometimes we're the animal. You know what I mean? Like it, but like mm-hmm. there's there's relationships there. But the the piece here is like so Rowling is trying to show you that you're applying that Hermione is applying the wrong lens to the scenario. Right. But we, what we don't get, which I find interesting, is like, and maybe the, somewhere deep in the lore, there's something about this, right? You know, but I don't. I, don't I haven't know. read all the fanfic. Me neither. There's but a lot of fanfic out there. We don't know the context, and we don't know where Hermione screws up is not asking the elves, right? Like, like, right. But the reason she screws that up is she believes they're being compelled, right? So she believes in this, you mentioned earlier, the sort of white feminist thing, like you're, if you're a victim, you can't make your own decisions, right? Like, sure. you know, which is a serious problem in that, in that narrative, but she believes they are being magically compelled to feel certain ways because mm-hmm. they hurt themselves if they disobey their masters, right? Like sure. their masters can be Possibly. like, cause yourself pain for disobeying me and things like that. Mm-hmm. So in the lit, so I'm going to, steel man Hermione for a second. She's looking at a scenario where she's like, I live in a world where people can literally manipulate people's minds with magic. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so if I say to the house elf, do you want to do this? And it says yes, but it's under some kind of magical contract. Is it able to consent? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. So that begs the question, where did this relationship come from? Right. You know what I mean? And so if we apply our dog lens another time, then there is something here that it's somewhere between compulsion and consent. Yes. You know, like there was a couple of, well, okay. So the first thing is dogs show up on the, on the scene like 30,000 years ago. Nobody yeah, remembers. Way it. fucking old. Way fucking Nobody old. knows. Older than writing. Right. Yeah. Older than like, yeah. no, nobody knows how we got here. Right. right. There's some theories. They compete. <laughs> we don't, there's not a leading one. Like, so are they hunting companions? Are they, did, did somebody like shout out just like, well, are they predators that you're trying to appease? And then right. they get a little friendly, like no one really knows. So right. we don't know, but we can guess that uh, the wolves did not have pugs in mind when they got into this arrangement. Probably. Yes. But oh. I don't, maybe <laughs> I like the wolf who's like, I just want to be small and unable to breathe. <laughs> right. It's like a really subby pug. It's a subby <laughs> wolf. You know, he's like, what if I, what if I had to struggle to live, <laughs> but I was right. carried everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, what a life! I, yeah, I don't think that's what they had in mind. No. So, so we, there's a there's a question here about like um, the origin of. So you know, whenever we're evaluating, um, you know, I, I feel like what we're kind of doing here is we're using this as a literary analysis in order to yep. understand how to live in the world, right? And so there's an idea here about how can we understand relationships that are potentially compulsive but always more complicated than that. We can always understand that there's something more complicated here. And part of, you know, if we're thinking about Hermione, she's 15, you know, like, yeah, yeah, do her best, you know, but we don't have to act like 15 year old girls. No, no, we can, we can think things through. Right. 
And so thinking with, so staying with, staying with dogs for a minute there, the, one of the things I always love from that, um, the way, way forest thing or forest thinking book, the, mm-hmm. oh, the shoot, Eduardo Cohen. Cohen. Right. Yes. Yes. How forest thing. How forest thing. Yeah. One of the things, one of the little anecdotes I always liked in there was, um, the people giving dogs ayahuasca to teach them mm. that they, there's enough of a crossover between dog spirit and human spirit that sometimes dogs need a, need an ayahuasca trip to get right. Mm. And, and they have a protocol for doing this. It's not meant to poison the dog. You know what I mean? The dog is supposed to come out better at the other side of this, just like people are right. It's a medicine thing. Um, but they have specific songs they're singing to the dogs when the dogs are in the state to make them better dogs. And he was like, from what I can see, this makes them better dogs. Like, you know, it, it helps right? Yeah. because dogs have to navigate our culture. Right. Sure. Sure. You know, and, and dogs have shaped our culture dogs. This have, is that 30,000 year thing. Like dogs yeah, are, yeah. we, we are not us without dogs at this point. No, no. Uh, human, yeah, exactly. There, there's too much of an interdependence, too much of an intershaping. I like the theory we've talked about it before, but I like the theory that dogs helped us learn fair play. Clearly, they helped us learn pack behavior uh, in a way that's different than other primates. Like we, we, we act differently, um, sure, yeah. than other major groups. Um, and and the dog intervention seems to have been a part of that conversation. I don't think it's the whole conversation, but. Yeah, humans um, are good at social cohesion in a way yeah. that uh, other primates are not necessarily. Right. Um, so what's, what's interesting there is like, okay, so if I'm training a dog, there are ways to train a dog to enculture a dog. Mm-hmm. And there are ways to abuse a dog, right? Like, so, so there's, a way, there's a way on the spectrum just to beat a dog and it just does what you tell it to do because it's terrified of you. Mm. and you've mistreated it and that doesn't really work you know what i mean like we like we that dog mm. will turn on you at some point right hurt people hurt people yeah yeah exactly yes um and so we have an implicit responsibility to bring dogs up correctly mm. and and like we do kids to teach them that what their role is in our joint society and mm. work together with them on this and we you know this is one reason i do get mad when people treat dogs as if they are people and don't give them or as if they are humans and don't give them dog Mm -hmm. things to do right Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. you know you can't be mad if if you have a terrier and he barks at the window every time somebody walks up to your door you can't be all that mad at him you can you can teach him but like that is his job his function is to protect the house and mm-hmm. to attack anything that comes in the door. And so you got to like give him a container for that. But he, if you're mad at him for doing that, why did you get a dog? You know, like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, um, but I had an incident in mind where uh, I knew someone who was training a, a, a doodle mix, right? 70 pound dog, big dog, but not like crazy big. And, mm-hmm. um, the person training this dog was doing a real bad job. Like, the dog was jumping people every time they came in the door. Just too excited, too much energy, too much everything. Mm-hmm. And one of this person's friends who had dogs for a really long time, had trained a bunch of big dogs. The doodle jumps up on them. The person knees the dog in the chest, right? Not like, not like tie knee, this, you know what I mean? But like puts her knee up and puts it in the dog's chest and forces her down and sure. says, hey, 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 we don't do that. You know, that kind of thing. Uh-huh. The, the human of this dog went nuts. Yeah, sure. How dare you touch my dog? How dare you do this? How dare you do everything else? But the dog responded well. Sure. Because the dog learned something in dog language, right? Like mm-hmm. that's how that's how a mom dog would teach that same, you know, dog who was dumb, jumping around too much. It's like grab him mm-hmm. by the scruff of the neck and go, like, hey, chill, chill out. You got to stop. Mm-hmm. So how when we think with this stuff how do we think about communicating Mm -hmm. right back and forth like like what do we what are we communicating such that we can be understood on the other side yes right which is going to be different you can't you could do that all day to a cat and it does 
<laughs> Wouldn't make any cat don't give a shit. Can't, and you can't do it to a cow. Sure. C- cow's too big. Cow's going to kill you for doing that. Like, <laughs> do cows jump up on people like that? I don't <laughs> They They will charge if you're feeding. They will, like, come in to get the food. Oh, okay. They don't, they just don't give a shit about you. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're like, <laughs> yeah. they're just like food. And if you get uh-huh. 10 cows coming at you and you're on the fence and sure. you're kind of between them and the food, they don't mean uh-huh. to, but they will trample you to death. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. Your knee isn't going to help. Yeah, he's not going to help at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about a 70 pound dog. This is a, this is a different situation. <laughs> a thousand pound cow. Stop. Right. <laughs> you stop a shit with that. No. All right. So, so while we're here on the question of slavery, though, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was something else that I, I've been thinking about for a while because I, I do I have opinions about slavery and I've been thinking about shit for a while. And, you know, because uh, I, I, I really noticed the legacy of it and I really <clears throat> but I have spoken publicly about how I am so tired of the way that we are kind of walled in by the current narrative around slavery. There's something else. There are different ways that we can think about it. And so it's, this is why it's important to think with the different slave narratives that exist, including the one that exists in uh, Harry Potter, which may or may not be a slave narrative, but we can think with that. And uh, there are other fictitious slave narratives like Kindred by Octavia Butler or um, The Last Vignette in Four Ways to Forgiveness by Ursula Le Guin is super dope. Um, And so there are many fictitious slave narratives which can be useful thought experiments and ways to think into what slavery may or may not be. Well, and also different historical versions of slavery itself. Like, you know, we, we are talking when we, in America, we think about race-based chattel slavery, you know, the sort of like that thing, but that is not the only way slavery has taken a shape. Mm-hmm. Uh, or can history. take shape. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. And so, so there's that. Um, I, I was, I was, I was going to expand to that <laughs> um, coming back down a little bit <laughs> to uh, like the kind of like American sphere. We can think with um, uh, historical slave narratives. We can think about uh, Phyllis Wheatley and Frederick Douglass and this kind of thing. We can also think about uh, one of my favorites is Ali Sadiq, who uh, has spent uh, some time in prison and compares it to slavery all of the time yeah. and uh, knows his fucking shit. So um, I, really what I'm doing is I th- this is a reading list for you the listener yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if people have not been paying attention or if these <laughs> names feel unfamiliar to you you perhaps investigate many of these names right yeah exactly exactly you're kind of breaking up a little do bit we, but we got glitch? you there's also a heat wave going through that is messing up the world's internet which i, f- I find endlessly pleasing yeah you like that you like it when it's so, so hot that you think you're going to die and you can't even talk about it? <laughs> I think it's funny that, like, you know, we haven't bothered to fix things enough that, like, heat still messes up electricity. You know what I mean? Like that. Sure. I, yeah. Well, electricity electricity is uh, is finicky, as I understand it. <laughs> that's, Although, that's about all, all I know. <laughs> yeah, for real, for real. Yeah, I was watching a storm last night, and uh, the, it started with heat lightning. Yeah, I fucking love heat and, lightning, dude. Yeah, and I was just thinking about heat lightning for a second. I was like, I, I, I'm wildly confused. I have no idea what's happening over there. It's big. Yeah. Okay. So, so we were yes, we were thinking with ways to. Um, uh, investigate our relationship to slavery as a concept here downstream from uh, the, the transatlantic slave trade that right. now right. not only influ- influences Americans, but because Americans have culturally come to dominate the world, then right. uh, the, everyone in the world, to some extent, is downstream of the transatlantic slave trade. So if they have hip hop in your country, for example, then you are downstream of the transatlantic slave trade. And so like, what does this mean for us and how can we relate to slavery? So 
One of the things that I have been thinking with here that uh, we and we've had this conversation, too, and you cooked my shit last time. So I am back back for revenge. <laughs> well, I'm because you you cooked me, but it wasn't I'm not quite convinced. And I want to start with where, where I was at. So left one, left one of the things rare as well left. Of <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. There's still a little kick left in here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so where. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed a lot about my own lifestyle is that I um, I care very deeply and listen to a lot of uh, like white conservative thinkers. Mm-hmm. Not all, I don't only listen to white conservative thinkers. I listen to black conservatives too. But the thing I I don't know, I've mentioned this in the uh, race podcast before is that uh, it the thing with uh, black people is that they only talk about race most of the time. And so you, they get kind of mired in talking about black people stuff, whereas right. white conservatives will just talk about conservative shit. And so I listen to them a fair bit. And, you know, like the these motherfuckers be having points a lot. One of the things that black conservatives say all the time um uh, on the topic of a legacy of slavery you know listening to people like glenn lowry or thomas Sowell, um or this kind of like that that kind of vein is like that there is a detrimental culture in black families that uh is optional that is a problem that it that becomes uh that that leads to criminality and the the same shiftlessness that um we were accused of while slaves mm-hmm. so so one of the things that i find really hmm, compelling interesting about this line of logic here is that so i've been reading this faith mitchell book recently uh called the book of secrets and I've been sort of like in, interested in hoodoo and uh, like the, the Gullah magic and, and uh, the lineage. Gullah is, uh, well, Gullah Geechee um, is, the, yeah. is the culture of the people who live in the islands off of South Carolina where uh, they, they're far enough away from the mainland that uh, they retain a different kind of culture. And uh, it's all black and it's it very, uh, well, it's not all black, but mostly black, but right. wide majority black. And uh, they retain some bits of the ancestor culture that uh, do not survive in uh, the, the mainland United States. And so yep. um, this book takes, and so I've been interested in that kind of vibe and uh, in hoodoo generally. And this book, The Book of Secrets, Volume 1 by Faith Mitchell, it takes place there uh, on uh, the, the island. Mm, I should remember which island it is. Um, can't. <laughs> I had to, had to look that up later. Um, but they the book of secrets is said to be this book that um a scholar had on him when he was captured and brought into captivity and so he he uh was like a magician and scholar and he he held this book and it's like a book is a book of secrets it's a book of occult knowledge it's got spells Mm -hmm. and shit in there i guess he refers to the book as somebody and most of the people around the the slaves who come into contact with it refer to it as somebody and um try to protect themselves against whatever it might think of them right yeah for sure they're afraid of being cursed and many of them are they suffer terrible fates it's bad news so <laughs> so what i am so just reading that book and thinking with it's a fictitious narrative which is the, exactly the right place for magic to operate mm-hmm. um i have i come into contact with the idea that so because the way that the transatlantic slave trade operated was to systematically destroy the culture of the slaves who had come to the right. United States and uh, make them forget who they were, then some of the, then really the only things that survived as African culture or blackness were, were the things that lived along the edges. So hoodoo survives pretty well. Yeah. And the magic of the Gullah people, for example, survives pretty well. Also, 
criminality survives because criminality exists on the margins, is out in this space where it is necessarily always trying not to be seen and sometimes gets by. And right. so when we get into a place where uh, gangster rap is uh, all the rage and, uh, you know, there, there are bits of culture that glorify violence and criminality and all of this kind of thing, the, th the things that black conservatives decry all the time, the, we can notice that. So a lot of what matters in hip hop and other black art forms is the performance of blackness. The idea that like what you part of the show is to go see them talk in a language that you recognize and do the things that you recognize and that that feel like home to you as a black person. Right. That's what um, that, that's why, you know, like you, if you talk to hip hop uh, people from the 90s and be like, yo, what, why y'all talk about all this like whack bullshit? And they'll be like, listen, this is what my life looks like. This is how right. and and niggas from the hood recognize it that's why they love it so much you know right and so there is so what survives is that which is able to survive in the margins and right. therefore um it is genuine blackness to be in that space that exists on the, that's why that's why I use the word funk in my name Zamboni funk right, right? funk is pu that's some shit you don't want around it's a, it's a bad smell right mm -hmm. like if you if you open the fridge and it's funky in there you have, you have some work to do yes, you know right? your Saturday just changed <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right exactly <laughs> so um, so it's that thing that you don't want around and it exists on the margin and that's where the real shit takes place in right. my estimation here and so where so one of the things that so coming back to why do I listen to all these like white conservatives, right? So one of the things that white conservatives really uh, offer is white people remember they, they have a, an unbroken tradition that was not systematically destroyed in the same way that black people's tradition was systematically destroyed. And as such, if we think of tradition as being a stabilizing force, then and a stabilizing force is something that can be really useful if what you're trying to do is uh, pull yourself up, for example, if what you're trying to do is pull yourself up, then you need something hard that you can pull yourself up with. And so tradition can offer that. And because there is not a consistent black tradition, which goes back, you know, uh, in an unbroken kind of way, perhaps to antiquity, we can look at uh, like Jyotish, for example, as right. being like this four, nine, 12,000 year old tradition, like right. these motherfuckers are real, or like the way the Chinese people make noodles. You ever seen somebody <laughs> the videos where they're like, they're like making these noodles like, and it's, like, it's Kung Fu, but like with the noodles 16 the generations of noodle making, like you're not yeah, going to get that yeah, yeah. from YouTube, be wild. you know what I mean? You're not going to get that shit. It's just not happening. Exactly. Yeah. Right. All right. So th there, because I don't have access to that, that, then I find myself looking to the traditions of uh, what end up being uh, the ruling class of the area that I'm in because they have the traditions. And this, this is where in our previous conversation, I did pick a fight. You did. <laughs> and you won. And, well, I, I don't, you know, I'm not here to, but I, what I want to lay out is so we can move to the next thing. I just want to lay out my my objection to this presentation of tradition by um white conservatives and the heart of it is that um i actually think what most white conservatives are putting forward as a tradition is a construction from the victorian period um and possibly going back to the early modern period but certainly the victorian period of a kind of a history and a kind of a tradition that um, creates isn't isn't effect about creating whiteness rather than a uh, or the West as a myth, but particularly a white West, which we'll I'll, I'll clarify in a second. Um, and so the appearance of tradition here is actually it is a tradition, but it's that of the people who have been selecting this in order to create their own power through the use of it 
often excluding other groups that you would think would be classified under the same group, but are actually excluded by the same process. For example, uh, Italians, Celtic folk, um, you know, uh, Slavs of any variety, like these people are, are a hundred, like my great grandmother did not think Italians were white people. She would not have accepted them as white. She would not have let them in her house. She thought yeah. that was the same Slavs, same thing, Spanish people, maybe, um, mm -hmm. depends if they're from the North of Spain, possibly, but not trustworthy Irish people. No Scottish people. Sometimes do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's this mm -hmm. intent because they are excluded from this created tradition in order to create the tradition. Right. And, and my, my point on this is that the assemblage of a canon of literature that excludes a whole, whole lot of folks. So for example, uh, actually, Dr. Uh, Justin Sledge has a bunch of good shit on tracing the philosophy of magic and how that the magical philosophers from the Middle Ages and Renaissance were incredibly important to the standard philosophical line. But what gets taught as the standard philosophical line in colleges is like Thomas Aquinas, like Plato, Thomas Aquinas, modern philosophy. Do you know what I mean? Like, like mm -hmm. Dick Hart, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and you're, you're jumping a lot of steps and you're leaving a lot of people out intentionally to mm -hmm. remove those ideas that don't fit the pattern for what we're doing here. So like my, my, and so to, to quickly summarize, I have a big objection to, for example, canons of Western literature that don't include Islamic writers because mm -hmm. there is no West without Islam, just on a functional thing. You don't even have the books. You don't get mm -hmm. the Greek books without the Islamic stuff, but also even just the, the idea of chivalry, right? So like we think about knights and stuff as being a part of this European tradition and the code of chivalry and like it gets brought to everything else was largely created by Salah Hadim. Like it is, it's, it's something we imported from the crusades back to Europe. Right. Like mm -hmm. geomancy is important, actually. But like it's Yeah, and Western astrology. What is Western astrology without the Arabic tradition? Right. And so a lot but if you what? say this to a lot of like even my even my boy Chris Hitchens did had did not have this in top of mind when he was talking about the Western tradition. He saw the Islam as a as a fight, right? The West fights mm -hmm. Islam. Mm -hmm. Um and so so when you start to pull at this, this is my objection is that this is a fake tradition that reifies a kind of like control rather than widening to look at like what is the problem actual traditions you know what i mean so it also mm -hmm. destroys traditions in the process which is but sure i don't want to say it's the I same would... by the way as slavery i want to be clear like like atlantic slave trade there was a, a concentrated effort to do something that's different yeah right there's something organic about you know like uh sort of like fighting it out and then to the victor goes the spoils a little sure. bit. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and, and we're, and we're going to take your shit. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, yeah. and I'm going back to the crib with it. And if it's dope and it stands the test of time, then it stands the test of time. And I'm going to put my fucking name on it. Were, were these, were these, were these reliefs and marbles? Were they, were they on your temples? I don't think you should have them. I'm going to put them in my British museum. Like the British museum is sure. the heart of all of this, right? Like it's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a the I've I've heard uh, Native Americans say that sometimes be like ah, they won <laughs> we don't like it but but they won you know <laughs> so like and, and there's a certain kind of and Potawatomi people from whom I am descended they were like you right. know what fuck this we're gonna die instead <laughs> you know right. like. Take, take that, white choose people. death. It's like, <laughs> yo, that's pretty it, gangster. It is amazing to create a culture that other people would rather die than be a part of. They're like, it's so boring and so awful. <laughs> I would rather, if you make me listen to that music one more time, I'm just going to die. I would just prefer <laughs> to die. Right, right. I will not square. eat that bland chicken, sir. I will starve. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's a, there's something there's something interesting going on here that that I don't necessarily like. You know, this were, right. this brings me back to the whole um, the story of um, Eshu and uh, Shango, where Shango is uh, they they're like in West Africa, and uh, some white slavers show up, and they're like, 
uh, and Shango is the war god, and he's going to go fuck him up. And then Aishu was like, yo, chill. We'll get him tomorrow. Why don't we drink tonight instead? And he gets him drunk, and then he gets, and then he goes, and he, like, helps the slavers out, and then they get on the slave ship, and then they come over to America. And then you get jazz and shit. So, like, yeah, it's complicated. It's a complicated relationship that yeah. now that we are downstream, how do we exist in this space? You know what I mean? Like, how do we, how can we live with this? Because there's something important going on here and we, and right. you know, and we are all downstream of it at this point and yes. sort of like uh, pointing fingers gets us nowhere. No, and, and no, and I would also point out that while I think the tradition that I'm referencing here the and the canon and everything else that I'm talking about, it's not that I, th I think that should just be widened, but I don't actually think there's a lot of books in there that should get thrown out. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Like, I think mm -hmm. there's really mm -hmm. valuable things and there is a, we should have a tradition that talks about, you know, all the wonderful mingling that came out of the Mediterranean, right? From North Africa, you know, Spain right. and everything like this, like we have to understand this if we want to understand how to do life well, like this is important mm -hmm. uh, stuff. Um, and and so the interaction of but but even besides my utopian view of it the interaction of that created conservative white culture with mm. the other culture is already that's a historical fact that is what happened there's a lot of latin names running around do you know what i mean like this is like thomas jefferson thought of himself as a roman person right mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. and right and so so he's got a tradition to draw on here yes he does have something that he is making and drawing from for sure mm -hmm. yeah. you know because so like if we look at the state of black people right now um we don't have we we've got kwanzaa you know goes back to the 70s right you know like that is, <laughs> there's a lot of people older than that right now you know and and we and then we could look at Kwanzaa. Then it's a, you know so Kwanzaa for folks who don't know at home is a is a created holiday that is that happens at the end of the year. It's like Christmas time, but like black focused. And so there's uh, a bunch of Swahili words that are incorporated in the thing, and that we sort of like uh, get together and uh, and there's a menorah and shit. And but it's not a menorah; it's a, it's a black one. Trust me. And you know like this whole and so and it's created by an FBI informant. Um, and so the whole thing is like kind of messy, but the idea of it is to give black people a black thing that we can sort of stand on and to generate a tradition. But we don't have a tradition right now. One of the things I mentioned before is that uh, one of the reasons why, so like uh, we, you know, uh, one of the strongest institutions in black America is the church. And so uh, I remember struggling mightily in high school being like ah like how how can i reconcile the fact that this is the masters the enslavers uh tradition here how or uh god like i and so i didn't for a long time i just i was just right. like fuck that i'm not doing it um and then you know you run into the thing where it's like mm, uh, actually this sometimes slaps the this, this goes yeah. pretty hard a lot of the time maybe we should, <laughs> yeah, exactly. we should look back at this uh, <laughs> you know but so there's that but then um so the the one of the strongest institutions in uh black america is the church yeah, i was just gonna say real fast if you haven't actually gone to a to a church to a black church if you haven't actually like gone and gone to this don't really know what's happening there <laughs> like if, if your only experience is from movies and and you know public events and things like that you have not actually experienced it like that's that's if you think it looks cool on the outside like that you're still you're it's not you know you haven't had it it's true it's different it, it lasts much longer than it does in that one it's, scene. It's, the brothers. it's far too long. No. Oh, shit. It's, it's far too long. It's so long. One of my favorite... <laughs> one of my favorite um, I think we said this back and forth. There's just like a little clip. Um, but it's... Um, somebody saying like, when, uh, when you've been at church for four hours, you finally get to like Sunday dinner. 
and the preacher starts starts preaching over the over the dinner. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's just this guy. And this guy stands up and he starts preaching. He starts. It's not praying. It's preaching. He starts doing it, uh-huh. and you just hear this old woman in the background go, "No." <laughs> Word. <laughs> yeah, this is a real thing. <laughs> yeah, or or go to the revival and be in just be in church all day. <laughs> it's like, yo, it's it's six for like o'clock. a week. Or it's all day for like a week. <laughs> for real. For real. Oh, it's so that's much. your summer vacation, dude. Like <laughs> yeah, for that. real. For real. Oh. A lot I spent a lot of summers over there being like, yo, are we still here? Can we go outside yet? Oh Can my I pass God. out? Can I can I get slain in the spirit or some shit? What does it take to do that? Because I just need to be somewhere else. Right, right. There's something too, like if you ha- if you aren't close enough to a tradition to be so tired of this bullshit, then yes. it's not, it's not really legit for you. Yeah. Um, but I do also want to say, like, uh, real fucking magic, real sure. healings. Real, Mm -hmm. real people having lives completely changed. And in many ways, one of the founding pillars of a can change an entire country. Do you know what I mean? Like it's like civil rights movement is, is built out of the church structures. Like it's, you know, it's not all church. There's there's other stuff, but like, yeah, the church is big. So, you know, yeah, it's an important institution that that you can't just toss out. You, you you gotta, you gotta incorporate. It's gotta be part of the thing. And so, There's there's something here about like how do we reckon with that and like you know like <laughs> it's not so, for everybody also like no. you know like we need we need something be, so if we're not going to do that then we're going to do Kwanzaa like you know but there's, there's just nothing else to do and so you end up like subsumed into the mother culture and there's a certain amount of like, all right, so we create the mother culture. So like, we're going to, we got hip hop and so, and white people are going to love it. And so we're going to do, uh, and are never going to be quite as good and whatever, whatever, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Like shout out to y- y'all know, y'all the know two. the ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you know them for a reason. There's only two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they get a lot of acclaim for being those two. Right. Sure. Yeah. So you know, and then there's a whole, whatever, doesn't matter. So, you know, but the, I don't know. I'm just so tired of the same old way of approaching that I really right. just need a different way to think about things. And so for that reason, I end up listening to a Jordan Peterson or something like this and being like, this nigga spitting. I don't know what else to like. <laughs> he'd, be, he'd be having good points a lot of times. I'd be like, hey, yeah. Are you, you got another one, dog. I don't know what to say. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> the it's what's interesting to me here is um, I'm a big fan of because I one of my objections to the the way this this tradition is presented, right? Because like I think it's wrong to say there isn't a tradition. There is a tradition there, right? But it's being presented a certain way. Um, is that I think it hurts a lot of people intentionally to create what it is, right? I don't think sure. Jordan Peterson is always guilty of this. I think in many ways, Jordan Peterson is probably a very well-intentioned person who the stuff you don't like about Jordan Peterson is probably because he's trying to do something good and he's kind of gotten muddled. Right. Like, mm-hmm. I, like, I don't think like I do not think he is an evil human being. I do not think that he I think he is striving for the good, um, whether I disagree with him or not. doesn't matter. I think that's that's what he's trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, the but the problem is, is that <clears throat> this tradition. Is too shallow to support what it needs to support. Right. Mm-hmm. It could it can contribute to the new better thing we're talking about, but it's kind of run its course and it doesn't work. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe narrow more than shallow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Narrow. It's too narrow. Yeah, and mm-hmm. so, um, and because of that, it it's a it's weak in a lot of ways, and sure. it's addicted to power structures, and it's addicted to these things that are. It's it's really not anti fragile, right? Like if we think about that, mm-hmm. like it's a it's a it's a narrow fragile system, and yeah, requires a lot of violence hybrid. to maintain it. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the. It's one of those things where, like, 
it probably should contribute to the conversation. But if we stop here or look to the past as if we are, re- we are doing it, then mm-hmm. you're not actually doing what should be done with the material. Like it's, it's not, that's not, the, that's not the way. Right. And this, this, this is part of the, where I was trying to go before and then got lost. Um, we like, we have to, so part of the reason I've been talking all this shit on Kwanzaa is because, uh, we are not in position to genuinely create new traditions. Part of the reason why the Bible is a, a religious scripture and not a cult classic is because it has stood the test of time. For many, many generations, people been ha- have been looking to this text and it's been, and Jordan Peterson makes the point that like the Bible is responsible for literacy in the world. And sure. I'm not, I'm not mad at that. That's, so that, with, that gives us a wide scope that goes back a long way. And right. so the, this is not something that we, you can at best, at best, you can write a cult classic. You can't write a scripture. What's funny about this to me is that there is a period of time in which the book of John is a cult classic. Ooh, talk about that. So, <clears throat> we think about like the early creation of, of the Gospels, right? Um, mm-hmm. And there's a lot of really good books on this. Um, the first 100, 150 years of Christianity, nothing's written down. Mm-hmm. Um, or at a very minimum, almost nothing survives from that time period. The mm-hmm. classical sources... about the we, cipher. Everybody just got together on a street corner and rapped. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much it. And then they were they were arguing about shit. There's like 13 different like you have to talk about Christianities. You can't talk about Christianity, you know. Uh this is where everybody gets all horny for the Gnostics, you know. Um, but like we we know, for example, from the Roman sources like Tertullian, that he's pretty sure it's him, he's bitching about the fact that like uh he's making fun of Christians. And he's like, and they're always talking about Jesus's mom, like she's something special. Well, that's interesting because that means that the Marian view of Christianity is one of the oldest views. That's one of the oldest teachings that's out there. Like, it was enough of a thing that Tertullian is like, let's make fun of those guys because they're always talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's different than what you get in the Gospels, right? That's not, Mary's role is muted a lot in those particular Gospels that exist. And then, you know, it's very clear that like the Book of Mark and a couple of other ones are written in a post- Rome has destroyed the temple time period and under Roman occupation. And one of the reasons the Jews are often the target of anger in those books is that um, they're trying to suck up to the Romans, right? They're trying to be like, don't, don't destroy us. Like you did the temple. Like don't, you know, we, we've seen how that goes. We don't want any piece of that. We're not like those guys. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so then there's like, three or four, or maybe actually there's probably, I can think of if you include like the Valentinian gospels, the gospel of Philip, a couple of the other ones before you get the canonization, before you get Constantine coming in and being like, these are the only books that count. There's like eight that are competing to be the main, the main books. But, but at that point, they're all just your own cults classic, right? You're a, Mm -hmm. you're a, Mm -hmm. Trish, a tradition, a Christian who's been taught by Mary Magdalene's line and that you're a Magdalenian Christian. That's what you are. You know, you're a Thomasine Christian. You're this. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so until these things continue to survive long enough, they are called classic. So everything in the Bible was at one point a cult classic, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So what you're saying is that you can write a cult classic and in the hopes that it yeah. will turn into tradition. Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. we have that power, right? Right, right, right. Uh, you can become Shakespeare, for example. Shakespeare yeah. is a classic and is a genuine classic, right? Not, yeah. not just some shit that they like. That you know, it's not uh, the Big Lebowski or some shit like that. Where you know, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> I, would, I would call the Big Lebowski a cult classic. I would call it even. It's it's getting on classic. It's getting on. It's get. It's close. It's, it's not close. to Shakespeare though. Sure. The on time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and what's interesting has it about, stood the test of time. And what's interesting about Shakespeare is who didn't, right? So, like, mm-hmm. we know about Shakespeare, right? Uh, you know, most people 
throw the name Shakespeare around, they know it. Some of them might know Marlowe. You know, they might know that this dude was a competitor and actually Shakespeare's uh, the guy who's better than Shakespeare in the beginning, who he looked up to, um, mm-hmm. catches a knife in the eye because he was being a spy, you know, that kind of thing. Um, Happens, you know. No one, unless you have done some academic shit, knows Ben Johnson. Sure. But Ben Johnson was a motherfucker and he wrote a ton of great plays. And even um, he's not he doesn't have the same human touch that Shakespeare has. Right. Like there's Mm -hmm. a difference there. There's a reason I'm not trying to argue Shakespeare isn't important because of what he did. I think what he did transcended, like it really did. But Johnson was as popular. Johnson was poet laureate of England. Johnson's plays were sold out all the time. Johnson's Mm -hmm. a bad motherfucker who one day challenged a dude to single combat in a, in a war, walked out, killed the dude, took his shit and walked back to his, his own line of things. He once decided to walk the length of England because he felt like it. And when he died, he was like 600 pounds. Like, like he's just like fucking intense. Right. Yeah, what a life. A genius. Not in, but we don't remember. Him. Sure. Okay. Well, so this is interesting. I didn't expect to go here, but uh, week after week, I've been up here complaining about uh, the economics of the situation, you sure. know, uh, and so I don't know, I don't know if, uh, Shakespeare was selling out, but you're saying that Johnson was, and they so, both were, they were both big names and Johnson actually helps. If I remember correctly. Now I'm getting a little dodgy. Um, Johnson helps put together the collection of Shakespeare's works, um, mm. that become the folio that becomes like the best of album, right. Mm. That, mm-hmm. that creates the Shakespeare canon that becomes mm-hmm. the thing that everybody knows as the work of Shakespeare, like the first one that they they okay, so these guys are like, shit. they like know each other. Oh yeah, like, they're competitors. They know each other. It's uh-huh. you know, uh, Johnson's kind of always salty about how how much love Shakespeare gets because he thinks he's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But, <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, like if he's a poor lawyer, it doesn't sound like he's like not getting love. No, but he's mad the whole time. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. like, oh, he was always That's like, what, Ben, what do you? Th- about willie's plays and he's like shut the fuck up about bill i don't want to hear about him anymore <laughs> you know he's been right. dead for 10 years yeah uh, <laughs> sure sure yeah so i uh, yeah so what we always talk about in that context is like uh writing in the name of hermes christmas justice or some mm-hmm. shit like this mm-hmm. right uh right. like trying yeah. like writing something that's so dope that it goes beyond space and time basically right right, right. And so that is what Shakespeare does. And yeah. we don't know why John, I mean, yeah, we don't know why Johnson doesn't get remembered. Right. The people right. and time chooses, like yeah, exactly. we don't, we can participate, but we don't decide. No, no, right. no one of us decides what Agreed. that is. And to be clear, if you haven't read Johnson, you should, he's great. Sure. Like he's like, he's really good. He's just not Shakespeare good. Yeah, right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, There's a lot of dope rappers out here. Uh, I don't have time to listen to all of them, it turns out. Don't have time to read all the good books. Like all all of that is a problem. So all right. So this gets a little bit into uh, what you were saying before about like uh, teaching in a lineage. Yes. Yeah. So we were talking about how the Tai Chi lineage I learned from has a couple really interesting features to it. One is a living lineage. And what it means is that like the other people who learn it are going to judge you <laughs> for what you say about it for one thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but you are expected to be able to preserve what you were taught and also add to it. So you're, you're expected uh-huh. to demonstrate that you can do the form letter perfect mm-hmm. and then show that you have a different take. And it's expected that your students will be able to do the same thing and also add Mm -hmm. their own shit. You know, now, obviously, this means it changes over time because it just slows the rate of change. Right. Like the because what I got from my teacher is not going to be the letter, even if it's his letter perfect, it's not going to be his teacher's letter perfect. You know what I mean? Like, it's just Mm -hmm. it is going to shift. But the idea being that, like, so there's that piece. You are expected to keep it alive, pass it on but you're expected to keep it living 
Um, and part of that is being able to demonstrate that you can fucking do it, which means in this case, you can fight, right? Mm -hmm. Like you got to be able to fight with it, um, in order to be able to teach it. And that's because at some point (laughs) it was some dudes who could fight who put this shit together, you know? And like, um, you can trace it mythologically back like about 400 years, 500 years, something like that. These dudes did live a really long time as well. Not 500 years, but, you know, they're like a lot of them dying in their 90s. So they have te- students all along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, we can really look at this northern Wu style tradition coming out of a guy named Wang Mao Jai. Um, Wang Mao Jai was a student of the Wu family lineage of Tai Chi. He uh, was a bad motherfucker who <laughs> was a street fighter and had a couple different under- other Kung Fu shit under his name started learning from the Wu family. They really got him straightened out. The guy's head straight. Um, they made him do the same, depending on which story you listen to, made him do one posture for six months to two years until he grokked what they were talking about. And then he, they, everything else he had mm. refused. He was considered to be the best at it, even amongst the, the sons of the Wu family, but he refused to teach out of respect until he moved North to Beijing. The family moves South. He stays in Beijing and they tell him you can teach the Northern tradition of this style. So, but at that point it becomes his lineage. That's late 19th century. I mean, late 19th century, early 20th century, right? It's the timing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's where the tradition is. It's based on a guy who could fight, who had to innovate, whose teachers left Mm -hmm. and he had to continue what he, what he thought was important. Right. Mm -hmm. My contention is that we are at the point, we're not at the point that I learned, right? Because I learned three generations from that. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, where we're at is for magicians and people who want to make a new culture and who want to make something new, we're in the street fighting stage. Like, Mm -hmm. we're in the, like, we got to make it, we got to show that it works uh, Mm -hmm. if anybody wants to learn from us. And, like, maybe our grandkids, maybe our great grandkids will be able to say they got a tradition, right? Like, that's, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, what I see here is that, um, okay, so if we are at a moment where, uh, like, traditional gender roles, for example, don't make any damn sense, then we are in a moment where there is a necessity of creating new traditions, again, no matter where you are in the world. Right. And so it looks a little bit like we Americans and perhaps as a result of the legacy of slavery uh, that chopped black Americans uh, lineage uh, to shreds are in a position to do that. And yes. it's, it's very street fightery, right? It's like, because yes. you have to, because your, your tradition traditions are not, it they 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 simply don't exist and so it's like if you um if you are an orphan and then like you're you're not asking your parents for help because you you don't what are you going to do where are your (laughs) you but you still have to eat and whatever and so you have to make it work for your for your damn self and so um we are now in a position especially since um we mentioned before that there when we were talking about dogs that there's a kind of cultural syncretism that is important in diversifying the lineage and moving forward Mm -hmm. hit it so the one thing we can do though that a lot of different groups try to do i think you Mm -hmm. still got a street fight still got to work but what do you think of the idea of either connection or reconnection to spirits. So one of the ways that Christian, let's say Christianity again for a second, gets sure. kicking is mm-hmm. that people have revelations. Spirit comes mm-hmm. down, angel appears and is like, yo, you should be doing this. Right. Mm-hmm. And that angel often has some kind of out of time or time lineage or something that it is representing. Right. Mm-hmm. In other words, the dog is teaching us. The do- like dogs show mm-hmm. up for thirty thousand years, but they have their own wolf culture for you know two hundred thousand years before that. Sure, and it's the interaction with that. So when we're creating the new way forward, 
do you feel it's helpful to bring in the spirit contact and be like, let me touch something that's not, it's not bound by these same conditions? Sure. Well, I feel like that was a leading question. I feel like <laughs> yes is the only answer to that question. <laughs> I mean, well, I, maybe yes is the only answer, but then how do we maybe? Is yeah, next, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, right, right, right. So, um, actually, I think that uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer gives uh, a great sort of idea about how to do this in Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, she calls it uh, becoming indigenous. Right. And so, and, you know, like, it, basically, it's listening, you know, like, if you if you do some spirit contact in the place where you are local, right? So that's one of the things that um, is very important about uh, what Indians call the old religion is uh, the the idea of like something that is place based, right? So um, our people emerged from this cave, or our people come right. out of the uh, from this mountain range, and like this, these mountains are the ancestors, or or something like this, right? Like it's got something to do with some kind of like uh, geographical feature that is the the birthplace of the people, right? And right. and all of the people call themselves the people. And so the people come from the land itself. And so there's something to do here with like listening to land. You know, I was just talking about this the other day, but this is one of the things that comes up in readings all the time is uh, people are like all up in their heads and they're like feeling a lot of feelings and don't know what what's going on. And so I like to um, recommend a journaling practice, but I don't like doing that shit. Like the the idea of, and I know you are one person in the audience is like, I like my journal and oh, I yeah. love that. <laughs> but uh, by and large, motherfuckers are not doing that shit, no matter how cute the journal is and how nice the pen is. And all, like, I just I cannot be bothered when I have Instagram to scroll through or some shit sure. like this, you know? Yeah. And so one of the things that I frequently recommend to those folks is um, walking around in the park. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I recommend, uh, <laughs> I think it is very useful to talk to yourself in the park. Work the I shit agree. out, say the thing out loud. Don't just be in your head about it. Don't, don't just like be quiet, say the thing out loud. When you yeah. say the thing out loud, then what I find very frequently is that trees have very, very good ideas. Trees yes. are very happy to supply you with some ideas. And the real great thing about trees is that they will let you think that was your idea. They don't care at all. That's all you. Go ahead. Do yeah. you. Just have you ever, have you, maybe we just float this one. And then you're like, aha, Eureka, <laughs> I found it. Wow. Oh my goodness. I cannot believe what a, what a glorious genius I am. I figured it out. And the tree's like, go ahead and go do that then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then sometimes you end up doing stuff and you're like, oh shit, the tree wanted me to do that. <laughs> that was sure. a, oh man, right. I just, I just served this tree. I, so it's good to, so if we're like in that place where it's like, I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to build a connection and I'm trying to build uh, a tradition in this locally geographically based place based situation, trying to connect with spirits. Then it's very good to listen in such a way where you can recognize which thoughts are mine and which thoughts belong to the sycamores. Yeah, I, um, so I have a, I've talked about this a little bit to some folks. I don't know where, I lose track of where I tell which stories. But um, when I was going through my divorce, uh, Jess Waters uh, suggested to me that I find a desire teacher, right? Like that I, I, I get, find a non-human person to help me understand what my true desires were and like sit with this. Mm -hmm. And the, person that came forward um was a particular beech tree um that wanted to teach me hmm. and um it's an interesting beach because at the time it's now changed in shape so I, it has a different name now but at the time uh i we called it the the hiding tree because it was a beech tree where all the leaves came down all the branches came down like willows and then on the inside there was a whole separate space with mm. this giant trunk and um like many beaches it was carved in because of course the the skin can handle it you know um and this was a place on Vassar's campus where like for 60 70 years couples had come to have sex do you know what i mean mm. like this sure. was this was a sex tree right uh -huh. and um i would go and i would sit with the tree 
uh, usually pick some daylight hours so as to not interrupt people who might be having other reasons for being there. Um, but I would literally just hold the branch, like one of the down branches. I would like, like holding the hand of a bigger, important person. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would sit and I would just meditate and talk with the tree about what are my desires? What do I need to know? What is desire? How do I even understand what this is? Right. Mm -hmm. Beach trees have desires. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like even just on a very like clear method, they, they want to propagate, they want to spread their stuff. They talk to other beech trees, they organize forests. They talk to other, other trees inside the forest. Mm -hmm. uh, they will kill oak trees. Like they mm -hmm. have a sort of like ongoing war with oak trees. They don't like them and they <laughs> fucking choke them out. You know, okay. um, they have a way of being that is a beach way of being and sitting with that tree as opposed to like, you know, this is instinct to be like, my desire animal is a tiger, you know? And you're like, what, do you, what the fuck do you know about tigers? You know what I mean? Like, like, for yeah, real, sure. like you go sit with tigers, you don't, you know, no, no. Um, but being able to do exactly what you're talking about, to sit with this tree. I mean, it rewired me basically. Hmm. Like it's one of my true teachers. And so hmm. my son knows this, but if people were, if I were teaching witchcraft, right. Hmm. One of the things I would say is is both, hey, you should learn this thing Jess said about like getting a desire teacher, right? Mm -hmm. But also yeah. like, this is one of mine. I can take you to the tree to see the tree mm -hmm. and sit with it if you want to. I can introduce you to the same spirit, you know. Um, unfortunately, um, for that particular purpose, the tree ended up getting broken in a storm. And mm -hmm. um, now her heart is wide open. So it's a whole different, she offers different teaching now, you know, mm -hmm. but... Mm -hmm. Anyway, like it's a specific land spirit. It's not like a, it's not like a romanticized land spirit. It's it's like no, it's mm -hmm. that tree right there. That's who you can talk mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's it's worth uh, listening deeply, quietly, and it's worth having an open mind, such that you could hear the voice of the tree calling you if the, yeah. an individual voice were to come forward. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's a, that's an important uh, thing to remember for our toolkit when we're thinking about how to generate traditions that are better uh, moving forward. And your own devotion. I think devotion is a really great creator of tradition. In that, like, mm -hmm. I went there every day. You know, <laughs> like, like it was a time where that was I I sat with my teacher until she was done teaching me and wanted me to move on to other stuff. Right, like. In the Tai Chi tradition, I spent a lot of time with my teacher before he was like, you're good, go go do your own thing, you know. So, you know, practices of habit and devotion, I think, are really important, not just for your own building, but also for what you can offer later on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And consistency goes a really long way yeah. in, like, every regard, like yeah, it the really does. First time, nobody gets anything right the first time. The, the the I guess the chances are not zero, but they are close enough that you should assume that it's zero. And you've got to do it a lot of times. You got to spend the time. That's part of the reason why even me and you continue to ha continue to have these podcast conversations oh, yeah. and conversations outside of the podcast and stuff because we are it's, we're practicing in some ways. You know. Oh, and, I. I always love, I really love Gordon. I think one of the best things Gordon put in my head was we're not trying to be right. We're trying to be less wrong. You know? Yeah, for real. You know, and like that, that is a really great mantra to, to, to do. And I think that's what we're trying to do with talking, you know, talking stuff out. And sometimes if people hear us go over the same thing, it's because we're trying to fucking work <laughs> out something here. We, it's not like, <laughs> Absolutely. I do actually get mad sometimes when you get to a podcast, we are like, well, settled and i'm like no it fucking isn't yeah <laughs> like, uh-huh uh-huh no like you did yeah, an well, hour and is... a half it's done you know no <laughs> right for sure for sure yeah this is uh this is why i always say like uh no answers only questions right yeah because we because the question is always gonna it's it's open you know we there's always the thread to follow there's always something to like move a little a little for further forward and then every time you've got an open question then there are seven open questions that come from that and yeah, then yeah. there are more open questions that come from those and uh so you, whereas a, an answer is a dead end and you you just get stopped and it's like the answer is blank and yeah that's 
that is simply not where we live at. It's true. Questions are the answer. Uh, okay, sure. <laughs> not going to bite on that one. I'm not going to bite. No, no, no. Not going to bite on that particular trap. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, I don't like it. I, <laughs> you miss me with that. Uh, but um, speaking of questions, we did have a listener write in. Uh, for a question for our divination and geomancy sesh here. Would you like to read for Helen? I would love to. Um, okay. So I feel like, I, you know, all this, we got excited talking. I forgot to count something. So let me, you tell me okay. one question. Now let me count this fucking thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and count your shit. And uh, maybe, maybe we'll do some uh, fancy po- we'll uh, post session editing and we'll, we'll we'll make it cute for the people so helen asks i've been trying to move house my house is sold subject to contract but until contract is signed by both parties it means nothing i'm struggling to find the right property am i looking in the right area west wales and when will i move thanks and a smiley face Thank you, Helen. Shout out to you. Um, so I threw a chart on this. We can, I'm just going to talk about it. Um, yeah, it's here. I can't yeah. even see it. Just No just one talk. can. It's, it's better to talk about it. So um, question is, you know, am I looking in the right area? Right. And then geomancy has a way to sort of look at the time component of the question. Like, when will I move? You know? And so question in this case is, you know, am I looking in the right area? Uh, I would say the chart is true because the fir- the person in the first house is uh, via the path. We're on the road. We're looking around for things. We're searching. We're moving. We're doing everything else. That feels good for this kind of thing. It's a fourth house question because it is uh, housing, home related. And we do see a perfection, meaning the answer is yes, um, between um, the first house and the fourth house. And the reason uh, and the, the method of that is... Um, by conjunction, which is a strong perfection, right? Strong, yes. Um, and the figure in the fourth house, fourth house is conjunctio. So contracts, crossroads, all mm. this kind of stuff. So it, that figure in the fourth house is also the figure of the judgment, um, which means that like contracts, conjunction, meeting people, this is really the heart of what we're getting at here. Mm. Mm-hmm. The right witness is Albus. So that's what you're bringing into this picture. So you've done everything right. You're trying to be wise about it. You're trying to work things out. You're trying to follow the rules and do things. Mm -hmm. And what the world is giving you is a shit ton of frustration. It's giving you Rubius. It's giving you Albus's opposite. So Albus's little Albus Dumbledore, right? Like it's, it's, it's actually in Harry Potter. So it's, you know, you got this figure of somebody who's controlled, maybe a little old, you know, kind of cool in their nature. Rubius is literally Rubius Hagrid. It's it's somebody who gets pissed off randomly, gets drunk too much, and probably has a pet dragon they shouldn't have, right? Like that's it's like this is the thing. Um, when those two figures come together, they they are conjunction, right? They make the figure of conjunction. It's uh, a little bit like you can think of this relationship. Um, Marissa and I talk about this a bunch as like the engineer that's albus right a guy who's an engineer and like a really fucking chaotic scorpio woman <laughs> you know who's <laughs> just like i you know she, rubius is is like taking her top off in the back of the car standing up in the in the convertible and being like fuck everybody i'm gonna do whatever i want i don't care and albus is quite happily driving her home because they're the perfect pair do you know what i mean he loves that she loves that he's driving right like that's what you got to get, which means that in general, in order when in order to lock things down, and I think you are going to lock things down because that's the sentence here is carcer, meaning that your journey is going to come to an agreement and then you're going to lock something down and get a house. Right. So everything agrees that the answer to this, am I looking in the right area is yes. You look in the right area. Hmm. But you need to make a deal like this is the this is the nature. So you need to meet people. You need to make a deal. You need to be looking for the deal. You need to be thinking about this. This is a mercurial figure. Conjunctio is is um, 
is the Virgo Mercury, right? Like, mm-hmm. so it's a, it's a Mercury that is detail oriented, that's law oriented, contract oriented, but is also interested in fucking. Um, and so, go ahead. Well, so uh, you you mentioned contracts a lot here, and yeah. uh, contracts was a concern, right? right. So uh, the the house the the current house is under contract, but not everybody has signed on yet, and so there's concern. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Okay. Like it's going it's going to happen, and the reason for that is not only am I looking the right area, all that stuff uh, perfects, but then also the time component is sooner than you expect is the answer so geomancy has kind of a couple ways to do time one of them is when you expect longer than you expect sooner than you expect in this Mm -hmm. case it means slightly sooner than you expect right you're going to get an answer on this that that says things are good um if you want to work with so there's a couple ways i would approach this magically if you want to kind of like lock it in you know what i mean like try to do some stuff Mm-hmm. One is just to really focus on the contract element. So spirits of crossroads, go to crossroads and do a thing. Um, mm-hmm. Mercury, you know, any of the sort of Hermes Mercury family of mm-hmm. folks mm-hmm. and asking them to get in. Um, I believe I'll ask, I'll consult my favorite astrologer. Um, we're still in a Mercury retrograde. Uh, yeah. Two more days. By the time this comes out, we won't be anymore. Cool. So uh, by the time this comes out, the answer being, you're not anymore. You may find things suddenly work easier, right? Because you're no longer in the Mercury retrograde. <laughs> the contract may sure. come sooner than you expect, right? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But those kind mm-hmm. of figures of like making deals, do some do some offerings, do some connections there, trying to grease the wheels. The other thing is the mm-hmm. figure in the uh, eighth house. We could look at it for magic, practical magic, is Amicio. It's a Venusian figure letting things go, washing yourself off. I would do like a general cleansing. You've been frustrated. Mm-hmm. You're dealing with this shit for a while. Get the gunk out. You know what I mean? Like just literally like wash off, cleanse off, get yourself pretty. Everybody likes it better that way. And the mm-hmm. other one is um, help comes in the house, the 11th house. So the house of gain in this case, um, Jupiter and Sagittarius is the, the general vibe. Um, so you can also look at like, talking some sky daddy about like get this house in so like you can do and this is normally how i approach things it's like okay i need the contract guy you talk to the contract guy i gotta get myself cleaned off so i'm not doing anything and then i need a guy to kind of manage things it's gonna be jupiter in this case come and bring me some help sky daddy and again Mm -hmm. these are the planetary energies not specific deities so if you think that that planetary container works for a particular spirit you could make a good argument that like Thor is a good Jupiterian figure in this case, right? Cool. If that makes sense to you, it's fine. Um, so that's my, that's my short there is like, yes, it, yes, you're looking in the right area. Yeah. It's going to happen. It's going to happen sooner than you think. But if you want to grease the wheels, that's the, that's the pattern I would get at. Okay. Okay. That's nice. That, yeah, I like that a lot. Um, that I'm interested to see how this, uh, how this goes against the astrology here because there's some some interesting stuff that is both the same and different so cool uh so this is helen's chart uh so we've got uh, helen was born on the 19th of august 1968 in harlow england at 3 40 p.m uh thank you helen for that um, all right, cool. So you did mention this is a fourth house issue. So we're we're looking at uh, home, family, foundations, domicile. Where where do you sleep at? Right, living conditions. So that area of this chart is in Pisces, and so Pisces is ruled by Jupiter. Pisces itself is empty, and so we're going to look at the ruler of Pisces. The ruler of Pisces is Jupiter. So we've got Jupiter here in Virgo. And so there's plenty stuff here in Virgo. There's a lot going on here. We got Mercury in Virgo. We got Jupiter. We got Venus. I noticed that we have both of the benefics here conjunct within about a degree. So this is, uh, although Virgo is not typically an area that either benefic likes, uh, Jupiter is said to be in exile or detriment here. Jupiter is as far away from home as possible. We can remember that Jupiter rules Pisces and is therefore opposite to that all the way across the sky uh and venus is in fall here
here, which is to say that Venus um, is not weak, but sometimes uh, can go off the rails with the Venus things I always talk about, um, like don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good and this, all of this kind of stuff when it comes to Venus and Virgo. We also have Pluto here and Uranus here in Virgo. So there's a lot going on in Virgo. This is interesting because over the last few weeks here, we've had a mutable T-square and Grand Cross. And so there's been um, a Mercury retrograde, which started at the beginning of uh, Virgo and then moved back into Leo. We had we've had a Venus moving through Virgo. So we've had a Venus return here. Uh, we have currently Saturn in Pisces, opposite to all the Virgo stuff. So this, to my, my mind, uh, definitely wants to slow things down. You mentioned great frustration also showing up in the yeah. geomancy chart. This tracks perfectly. Saturn is the, the slow planet, is the one that typically is associated with uh, delays and obstacles and challenges and bullshit that you kind of hate um, and that takes you a longer time than you wish that it would, all that sort of stuff. Gear grindy especially since we can remember as well that Mars and Jupiter have been in Gemini. So Mars is currently uh, there in Gemini and is getting ready to move out and move into Cancer. That's going to be a whole different sort of situation. We'll talk about that in a second. But uh, that alongside Jupiter in uh, Gemini has been T-square, uh, all of the Virgo and Pisces stuff. So that has been a lot of juice, a lot of like excitement and also aggression and not necessarily knowing what to do or how to do it, especially since two of those signs are ruled by Mercury and Mercury has been retrograde. So there's been all kinds of like looking back on stuff. I would guess that even since this question has come in, I would guess that some bullshit has gone down that has yeah. been uh, discouraging that might be like oh man am i am i not doing this right or uh, what's what's going on here so with that said um you mentioned already that we are about to move into a mercury direct period here so mercury is currently gonna station direct and uh late leo and then is going to move forward and then we're going to have mercury in virgo here alongside the ruler of the fourth house jupiter in virgo so that definitely this looks like wheeling and dealing kind of energy especially since we can remember that jupiter is still going to be in gemini at this point jupiter is the planet of uh, joy luck and abundance jupiter tends to want to affirm or confirm things and so this is going to be a jupiter who's trying to uh help in some kind of way, especially from a partnership angle. So mm -hmm. if you have a partner, maybe this is a, a, a like a romantic partner, a marriage partner, maybe this is a homie who you have been, uh, who, who's been like down with you this whole time and is, who has been helping you. Maybe this is like a real estate agent or something like that, right? Like somebody who is in this with you and who uh, stands to benefit as well as you, then, um, that relationship stands to help you in some kind of way. So it looks like the, the kind of thing where you might get some benefit from that kind of angle. And so I love what you were saying before about kind of like uh, gussy up a little bit, right? Like yeah. make yourself especially cute. That's not even necessarily uh, like, I mean, we do see that Venus is here in Virgo and whatever, but like that's not even necessarily anything to do with the magic as much as just like people will treat you better and will be more apt to say yes to you if you look cute. And so yeah, uh, there's a glamour there that's always on. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so that's always a good look, uh, cleaning yourself up real nice. I love that bit about spiritual hygiene as well. Like do what if you need to take a salt bath or whatever that whatever kind of things you need to do, then um, that looks like it wants to really, uh, you, you know, you can you're in a place, especially in the next couple of weeks while Mercury moves through Virgo, where the the wheeling and dealing, the like deal making, how can we, uh, can, you know, one hand wash the other, you know, I'll scratch your back, I, like I, I got a little something for you as well, you know what I mean, like that kind of thing. What I do notice here, and and Jupiter trying to say yes to that. Jupiter's like, yeah, this looks like some expansion. This looks like some kind something to be fun. Good. Let's do this. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. 
But at the same time, we do have Saturn here in Pisces. And so Saturn there in Pisces in directly in the uh, housing area of the chart looks like something that you, it's going to be very important to follow the rules. It's going to be mm -hmm. very important to, you know, you're not going to want to jump on anything like this is going to be a, the, the whole thing is going to move kind of slow and trying to force things is not how you get Saturn to move. Right. Like if we think about um, like an immovable object or or someone who's being stubborn or something like this, then like pushing on them actually makes them want to go the other way. And so what you're going to have to do is be cute, be charming, be, uh, you know, like uh, articulate and know what you want and know how this gets back to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, find ways to communicate such that you can be understood and um, that the, these seem like good strategies for moving you in the direction that you want to go. It's a little slow, but maybe tough. What's up? I see something on your mind. I like, so you said earlier, you know, like perfect is the enemy of the good, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, or the done. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something in the, in the geomancy chart that has this vibe of like, you got to make a deal. You know what I mean? You're going to, you're going to, you're, mm -hmm. you're going to need to make a deal. You're going to need to make compromise here a little bit. And sure. that's not necessarily a bad thing. You're going to get what you want, but Mm -hmm. If you're looking for the perfect house, sure, and that's getting in your way, the geomancy seems to say like eh, maybe maybe cut the deal, you know, if that's and fix it up later. You know what I mean? Like I'm not saying like put yourself in a bad spot. I'm just saying that or settle. I'm not saying settle either. But if you're like, well, I like everything about this, but I, I do need to redo the roof. If it's in your budget, maybe that's okay. Do you know what I mean? Like, or, or like, oh, this this place is great, but I got to take out the carpeting, and I got to put in new floors. Okay, mm -hmm. well, that might be that might actually be a good answer in this circumstance. Like, what can you what can you do? So, do you see that similarly with the Saturn and Pisces? Like, this, is that a kind of vibe that's similar? Of like, you might need mm -hmm. to take the deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saturn uh, in a deal making context, uh, Saturn can be contracts and mm -hmm. uh like long-term arrangements saturn can also be all of the reasons why it'll never work right there's right. a kind of pessimism about saturn that yeah. uh comes through a lot right a, sen a feeling of like oh this is never uh, right i i guess i'll just fine i guess i'll live in a cardboard box that right like this is yeah. this is saturn <laughs> and so um so there might be a certain kind of like gloom that could be associated yeah. with that a little bit. Like, I don't, I don't want to make a, make this kind of compromise, but maybe uh, there, yeah. I mean, it definitely looks like, you know, so Mercury is there in Virgo and trying to like do, do make a deal, make it happen. Yeah. You know, can we grease the wheels in whatever kind of way Jupiter's trying to be like, yeah, yeah, let's get it done. Let's get it done. But then Saturn's like, listen, you got to pay the piper here. And yeah. so, um, so there might be some dues that you got to pay. There might be something that there's something tough that you got to, that you got to take on the chin if you're going to you be eat a little bit. Yeah. I, this, this does feel a little bit like you eat a shot or two to win the match. You know what I mean? Like you're, you know, mm -hmm. you just got to roll that into the price of doing business. Um, sure. Sure. Especially since, you know, like, uh, we're, we're, I didn't get to, um, Helen's got the moon in cancer and uh, Mars is going to be moving into Cancer, and so that's going to be Mars right on the Moon, um, which is mm, inflammatory. You know, it's going to be and and that's in the eighth house. That's in the area of the chart that has to do with like other people's money and loans Debt, and stuff like that. Loans. You know, yeah, I don't like I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like it. It's not what I want to see. You know, um, yeah, and uh, that's another place for being cute, by the way, because the um, Eighth house is practical magic in geomancy, but it is very much also other people's money, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if you're trying to get loans, you're trying to do this kind of stuff. The, the the be cute is again like really important. Like, you need to like, you know, yeah. yeah we're I, gonna sit. We're actually gonna see a uh, Mars retrograde here through Cancer as well. So like, uh, so, so we might have to revisit some of the some of the actions or or. Um, you know, d decisive things that try to get made done at this point, we might have to see some of that again. I don't want to have those fights again. 
<laughs> so that feels like me with cancer. I'm always like, I don't have those fights. Um, yeah. So I actually think these play together pretty well uh, hmm. in terms of like, uh, um, you know, again, I tend to think of astrology as like the the landscape. Like, what what's your what, where are you walking? Mm-hmm. What are you dealing in? G Mancy mm-hmm. being like, well, what are you going to do now that you're in there? Um, right. And it seems to me that like, hey, the windows are going to open up in the next couple of weeks here where it's going to be a little bit easier space weather and you're going to be surprised but there's going to be some stuff coming up and but you may want to jump on it you know you may not want to be like i'm going to wait another two months to find the perfect place it might be better to be like if something shows up in the next couple weeks to be like okay okay how do i work with this rather than Mm -hmm. wait it out i don't know i was saturn moving through pisces you, with, with Saturn moving through the uh, the the relationship or not the relationship the uh, housing area of the chart, um, you know, slow might be the move here. Yeah, but how long is it going to be there? Till February. Yeah, and when is Mars going into Cancer and shit? Like uh, you know, next three days or something like that. You know, <laughs> Mars is and then, and there's gonna be, and it's not all mars and cancer mars is going to move into leo and then come yeah. back into cancer and so there's and that's a yeah, that's maybe, a whole ordeal that's going to take th- through about the same uh area of time till january yeah. february yeah so maybe that's the time frame maybe the time frame is better there where like you know you don't have mars and cancer saturn's kind of moving out you know this kind of stuff but i do think it's going to be sooner than you think i think you're going to get like right now you're at like when will this ever happen the answer is like mm, it's not gonna be that long right like i think that's actually what you yeah yeah, yeah you did get that yeah yeah so and we do have this mercury showing up trying to like wheel and deal and we it's nice to yeah. see that mercury there with uh with natal venus and jupiter and all that so um i will caution that geomancy is a make the deal take the castle take the win and mm-hmm. do it again kind of attitude to life sure like mm-hmm. it does it's very much like, yeah, yeah, I'll take, you know, it, geomancy would love the idea of like, you know, those, uh, those like mythological stories where guys like, I had five bucks, so I bought, you know, a Coke and I traded it for this and I traded it for that. And I tra- like geomancy loves that shit. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I turned a Coke mm-hmm. into a car. Like that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> geomancy would be like, good job. That's how life works, you know? Sure, sure. Uh, and, and you may not want that, that same thing. Yeah, well, in that same vein, uh, astrology is very good for uh, just making everything terrible. Like, <laughs> nothing will ever work, but fuck all of it. <laughs> so, one of the reasons why, like, uh, I think people like me so much um, as an astrologer is because I uh, don't, I don't buy into that necessarily. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm very like, all right, so these are conditions. And yes, there are spikes and lava and shit. Yeah. But like, you can be Mario. So like, yeah. how are we how are we how are we gonna do it? You know? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, you can have dope ass theme music. Yes, you yeah. can. Boo boo. Yes, you this can. Is, yes, you can. <laughs> I've been this is why I live my life this way. Maybe you should go to zambonifunk.com and check out the music. <laughs> Is there a place you could get some dope ass theme music to help you through your day? I think, yes. you know, yes, it's there even is. available on Spotify. If you're just looking to like throw some, throw some listens and likes down, you know what yeah. I mean? Like you could follow your heart to, to whatever, <laughs> wherever your music gets played. That's where that you could follow your heart to that place and put it, put Zamboni Funk in the search bar and you will find plenty, lots of things. And by the way, if if y'all like this sort of bullshit, this this is what getting a reading from us is like. You know what I mean? Like like if you like sure. this kind of like thing, it's like this. So, uh, but you get one on one attention, and I and I make what used to be called in the old books cow eyes at you the whole time. It's like, just dreaming, <laughs> just dreaming. Word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you want to get a. Man. If you want to get a geomancy reading, you can go to wilkinsbryan.com. Is that right? That's correct. You can you can find it there and um, do geomancy, do oracle cards reading, all the decan oracles, like all kinds of fun shit. And oh, um, yeah. yeah, happy to do it. And um, like I say, I'm actually I'm actually thinking about getting two readings from Zamboni for my yearlies this year. Uh, mm-hmm. I realized that Wyatt's getting big enough that maybe I want to like get him get him to find out what's happening in his chart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I reckon. By the way, I don't know if we've talked about this. But I totally recommend as a parent being aware of your child's chart 
and aware of the transits because sometimes you're like, mm. why are they acting so crazy? It's like, well, the their Mars astrology the is fucked up right now and you didn't pay attention to it, you know? Like, so yeah, yeah. Um, I keep offering things that Zamboni doesn't necessarily offer, but I feel like you'd read a kid's chart if a parent was like, here's the data. I read your kid's chart. Um, yeah. It- Dep- oh yeah i don't don't give me random kids charts that's weird yeah and age <laughs> age is gonna matter you know what i mean like just for the general public i don't know that i'm gonna do go for this Wait, if i'm, if I I'm do being like, real <laughs> this got real dark with the idea of somebody coming in with a random kids chart i don't like that idea sure at all. yeah, yeah, yeah right that. and do and i that. i simply cannot verify you know what I mean? Um, I, I have a, I have a, for the same reason that I don't do synastry, um, I have a, I have the, one of the reasons why I don't do this kind of thing is because I don't do other people's chart for you. And so welcome, welcome back to the session where I recommend the Zamboni does things. And he's like, please don't recommend that I do things. <laughs> right. I, I would love to do a reading for you and talk about what's going on with your relationships well, or your children. Say, is there but, a place in my chart where I could find out about my relationships to my children? Zamboni? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fifth house is real good for that sort of thing. So uh, we can, dope. yeah, we, we definitely can do that. And we, we, that would be specifically like talking about your relationship to your child and that kind of thing. Um, Which honestly, you know, if I, I can manage that, that's the best thing anyway. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not, you know, like there's just, there's a lot of philosophical implications to reading someone else's chart and I do it, but that's cause I can. And in fact, if you want to get down in this kind of way, then it happens that I'm also teaching an astrology course. And oh, so, shit. uh, we, I already ran it one time. I did a fundamentals course. Um, and it was the prototypical version and it was very good. Shout out to everybody who came through and I had some real great students. I had some folks who were brand spanking new to astrology. And so it really, um, gave me a good glimpse at what the curriculum needs to be. I got a couple of questions, um, that were like, you know, like very, very sort of like entry level questions. And I was like, I totally should have covered that. <laughs> that was a big hole in the gr- my, my well, fault. Doc. And to be honest, so one of the reasons my Tai Chi teacher was like, hey, man, you need to start teaching sure. because you can't learn until you get the students under. You know what I mean? Like all of a sudden mm-hmm. the students, you're like, oh, shit, I got to learn a whole bunch of other stuff. Like I got to go find the answer to this. To yeah. yeah. Out. So. What I'm saying is, if you want to get on the ground floor of being part of the Zamboni Funk tradition of astrology, now That's there's true. classes. You can, you, can, you can be early students. You can get in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are, we are on the way right now. I am currently electing um, where exactly I want to do it, but it's probably going to be like early November or something like this. Mm-hmm. So um, there's we we got a little we got a little situation where with uh, I think I might be able to catch a uh, Mercury in Sagittarius opposite to Jupiter in Gemini a little mutual reception mm-hmm. situation like going on over there That's with sexy. Sun and Scorpio you know I love the Sun and Scorpio you so love the Sun and Scorpio uh, <laughs> right <laughs> so so keep your eyes peeled for that um, I feel I I've gone back over everything we just had a Mercury retrograde I went back over everything in the curriculum and I um, revamped a bunch of stuff and I uh, redid. I, I made some assignments also last time. I didn't have any uh, any homework assignments. So now it's going to come with a workbook too. It's just going to be pretty dope. I think oh, that man. I'm going to make some pretty tough astrologers, honestly. I think if I'm going to train up some folks. If your, your inner Hermione is looking for extra homework, the man, the, you, you got stuff laid out. <laughs> Actually, a lot of people, that was one of the, in the course evaluation, like four people were like, yo, where's the homework at? And I was like, ooh, okay. <laughs> Right. Okay, nerds. Here you go. <laughs> right. Totally. So, uh, and they're totally right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and then, so by the end of this course, you're going to have read your own chart and, um, like we, I've worked that into, uh, the whole assignment structure and everything. So, um, I think, it's, so it's going to be super dope. Stay in, stay tuned for that. Yeah. You can't, yeah. it's not up on the website yet, but I, the, the, as soon as I get it elected, then it'll be there. And, um, it's going to be, it's going to be dope. It's going to be a fun time. It'll be eight weeks long and, uh, you're going to be a real ass astrologer doing readings by the end of it, no matter where you start at, including people who, um, had probably didn't make it to the end of this podcast, but who, um, <laughs> like, you know, just, just who are brand new to astrology and who maybe yeah. just like listening to us ramble about bullshit. I was gonna say, I hope Helen made it. I, 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 I'm gonna reach out to Helen. Hey, great news. Uh, between 
editing, and now I have actually elected the astrology course. So it is called Astrology from the Ground Up. It will be on October 24th, and we will meet every Thursday for eight weeks. There, are, It'll actually go on for nine weeks because one of them is Thanksgiving, and so we will uh, skip that one. But um, eight meetings where we will uh, learn all of astrology from the very bottom. So we'll start at the very foundations, the very basics of what's going on, and we will arrive at a place where you can read a chart. There's a bunch of assignments and homework, so it's, it's almost like a workbook kind of situation. So you will end up reading your own chart two or three times. Um, and so, and then there will also be some other readings that we'll do. So you will be a uh, wildly competent astrologer by the end of it. So um, it is available in the same place where you can book Zoom readings with me. So um, if you want to go to the scheduling platform, so if you go to zambonifunk.com and you click the book button or um, the first two buttons on the main homepage, are, we'll both link you there. Um, and that is how we'll do it. So I look forward to seeing all of you there. It's going to be dope. Um, but on that, by the way, we are finding this super fun and really useful for us to go over charts and play back and forth and do this kind of thing. So, um, you know, be on, again on ZambonyFunk.com. Look out for where you can sign up and offer, put the chart, ask your question, and we will uh, get back to you. And if you're not in the first round there, um, you can be in the, in the poll, in the lottery for what we pull out. Uh, yeah. down the road so you know mm -hmm. um, please do keep sending those in it's a lot of fun it's, it's great to sit down and look at that stuff yeah 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 it's, it's really good for us and uh, we and the last person that we talked to uh, what was her name Sarah um, something like that but, yeah 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 reached out and was was very excited about it and so um, yeah it, it sounds like we it, it sounds like it was valuable to her and so we are delighted to be able to do this kind of thing we love it thank y'all so much for being here I am delighted that we get to have this time together, me and you, sir, delicious Brian Wilkins. Everybody should go to wilkinsbryant.com. Check out zambonifunk.com. Peace and blessings to the family.